All right. Well, uh, welcome everyone, not to the library, but to my home um, to drive into dreamland, the work of John Waters. Uh, the reason we're actually doing this at home tonight is we just got back from Camp John Waters, which is an annual event that happens every year. And um, hence my shirt. And I was also kind of why I wanted to do the program in September, sort of a like a uh, tribute. Um, John Waters is, full disclosure, one of my favorite directors and just kind of one of my favorite public figures. Uh, I share a birthday with him. Um, one of the things I told him when I met him was uh, I share a birthday with two people that I admire. The first is my uncle, the other is John Waters. Um, and I do, his work is very interesting because when I first heard of him, I heard of him from his very, um, I knew he had the reputation of from his early work, but if you look at the course of his films and the course, and just over the course of what he's done with his career, you'll actually find a very um, intelligent and well-rounded man. And that's what I wanted to explore with this program. So I'm gonna pull up. All right, so here we go. Drive into Dreamland, the work of John Waters. So I'm pretty sure that everyone who's here probably has some idea of who he is. If not, um, oh, I was gonna say, Todd, could you admit? Just did. Okay. If you're not familiar, John Waters is a director. Um, he goes by a number of names. Uh, the father of filth. He is colloquially, colloquially known as the Pope of Trash. Um, he is, I think a provocateur is a good way to describe him. Author, artist, um, being from Baltimore, I think he should be considered the king of Baltimore. Uh, I know for a while there was that discussion of what's Baltimore going to do with that old Christopher Columbus statue. And there was at least from the John Waters community, a why not a statue of John? He's pretty great. Um, I do love this quote from John Waters because if you know anything about his work, especially his early work, John loves to push the boundaries. John likes to be in your face. He likes to kind of upset people. Um, but there's a reason he has a lot of fandom with people, particularly people who are kind of um, in you know marginalized communities, people who are LGBTQ. Um, so as this quote, secretly, I think that all my films are politically correct, though they appear not to be, and that's because they're made with a sense of joy. And one of the reasons I think John Waters endures for a lot of people and has such a passionate fandom is because, you know, yes, John pushes boundaries, but John Waters never punches down. It's similar to Mel Brooks um, or Airplane, where they're not making fun of people who really can't defend themselves. Uh, John Waters is never mean to people who don't deserve it. Um, and he'll never make someone who's marginalized the butt of a joke simply because they're a member of a marginalized community. There's actually a very good example of this. So in one of John Waters' first films, Pink Flamingos, um, David Lockery is playing a character who is goes around flashing women. Um, and he finds one woman who is played by Elizabeth Coffey. Um, Elizabeth Coffey was a transgender woman, um, or still is, she's still with us. So he flashes her and she kind of plays back and flashes her top half. And now Elizabeth Coffey at the time had not had full bottom surgery. So the way the joke ends is she flashes him back. But the joke is not that Elizabeth Coffey's character is trans. The joke is that David Lockery's character runs away screaming because he can't take what he's doing to other people, just hand it back to him. And I think that's a really good example of John's humor where he'll push the boundaries, he'll make a crude joke, but his jokes are never mean. And that's what I think that they're made with a sense of joy is very true. because. You really get the sense when you watch these movies, John is just having fun with a lot of his friends. So how did we get here? Cause I get this question a lot. How did I, 
uh, a normal nice librarian or seemingly normal daughter of two military people get into someone like John Waters. Well, when I was 10 years old, there was a video store in town uh, that I was on my way home from school. And rather than going home and doing my homework, I would just hang out at the video store, uh, surprising absolutely no one. And this wasn't a blockbuster. This was an independently owned, one of those great old VHS stores, which Todd's probably familiar with them as well. Oh yeah, yeah. it takes me back. Oh yeah. If I was born, I think 20 years later, that's probably would have what I would have done up until the end is just owned a video store. But um, they had a cult section. I was just like, oh, what's this? And I remember seeing the VHS covers and thank you to VHS collection collector for having the these images of female trouble and pink flamingos and just being fascinated by these covers like divine who is that? is in kind of having those, is this a man? Is this a woman? I'm not sure, but just being kind of fascinated. And then in 1997, I was watching The Simpsons. My parents, parents finally gave in and just let me start watching it after years of being apprehensive. And great episode, which by the way, does hold up um, Homer's phobia in which Homer meets a man named John, voiced by John Waters, who he likes at first, Marge Klusman, that John's gay and Homer, you know, has a very 1997 reaction, but then realizes, oh no, he's a normal, nice guy, just like everyone else and deserves respect. Uh, I would absolutely recommend seeking that episode out if you haven't seen it. But for me, this was like the formative John Waters experience. And then when I got a little older, I saw stuff like Serial Mom, Pecker, and Hairspray on TV. But 10 years old was when I first kind of got a glimpse of like, who is this guy? And I kind of want to know more. So a little background on John, his early years, uh, born April 22nd. So birthday, bud. Um, he was a premature baby. I love his, uh, his whole explanation for why he is the way he is. Just, I was just overly baptized. And I think some people look at John and think, oh, he must have had weird parents. They must have been like early beatniks. And he said like, no, he's, he's had normal family, normal upbringing. He's still very close to his sisters, uh, was close to his brother. His brother did unfortunately pass away in the early 2010s. Um, he's close to uh, any nieces and nephews he has. He actually, he's kind of still like, I had a very normal life and I still kind of do, you know, just aside from the movies he makes. Um, but he was an odd kid, which again, I think is why a lot of people feel this kinship with them. It's like, oh, I was odd too. I kind of get that feeling at the very early age of, I don't think I'm quite like everyone else. Um, and to his parents' credit, um, they basically are like, okay, our kid's odd. Uh, there's an interview with John and the Guardian where he's like, I just remember my mom telling my dad, like, well, yes, he's an odd duck. Just, well, well you know, that's that. And being kind of a, let's just let it let give him the tools he needs to get through life and go where he needs to go and his father actually loaned him money for some of his early films and uh john did say he eventually was able to pay him back although he says his father i don't think he's his parents have ever actually seen his movies maybe some of his later ones i think even he'd be like i'm not showing my mom or dad pick flamingos uh loved puppets growing up but not the muppet type he liked to just stage punch and judy plays um and I think surprising no one, he grew up loving movies. And he did grow up liking kind of the underground um, Andy Warhol stuff when he got a little older. Uh, Kenneth Anger is someone he cites as a reference, but he also loved the stuff like Douglas Sirk, old Hollywood mem uh, melodramas. He loves classic Hollywood. And around the time when he was young, around the time he was a teenager, he met another boy named Glenn Milstead. And if that name isn't familiar, you might know Glenn Milstead by another name, but um, his performing name, which was Divine. And the two of them got together and, you know, became one of the most iconic for the time director and actor duos. So this leads us into the friendship and early Dreamlanders. So we have Divine, AKA Glenn, Mink Stoll, who uh, still, uh, still around, they're still friends, Mary Vivian Pierce, uh, the aforementioned David Lockery. A lot of these people were performers. Um, they, would sometimes, they wouldn't perform exclusively 
in John's movies, but uh, you know, they did their own things, but they would always come back to have bit parts. Um, Elizabeth Coffey, as I mentioned, Channing Wilroy, Susan Wa uh, Walsh, Edith Massey, uh, very, very famous among the Dreamlanders. There's also people like Pat Moran, who was always his casting person, Van Smith, who created Divine's Makeup, Steven Yeager, who was his assistant for years. Um, and something you'll notice with John is, you know, he keeps his stable of, of, uh, of actors, mainly because they're his friends. Um, uh, Pat Moran it, it has worked with him on every single film he's made. Mink Stoll has appeared in every major film of his, the, but the woman who gets the honor of being in every single movie he's made is Mary Vivian Pierce. Um, as the years went on, her part, I, she had uh, some health issues, so her parts were a little bit reduced, but she has been in every John Waters film, including his earliest movie. So speaking to his films, who inspires John? I mentioned Kenneth Anger earlier, but again, sort of like the spectrum of what he likes. He likes stuff like Herschel Gordon Lewis. Uh, if you watched my exploitation films program, The Godfather of Gore. He likes Russ Meyer who would make, uh, you know, sexploitation movies. But he also likes people like Fellini or, and Ingmar Bergman, arguably, I wouldn't even say arguably, one of the greatest directors of all time. People like Andy Warhol, um, Ed Wood. And the one that surprises a lot of people, but shouldn't if you've watched his movies, is Douglas Sirk. And we will discuss how Douglas Sirk has influenced a number of his films a little bit later on. But if you look at this roster, it just shows the wide spectrum of taste that John has and how he manages to combine both lowbrow and highbrow, usually in a lowbrow way. So his early films, unfortunately, some of his early films are kind of just lost to time. Um, Hag in a Black Leather Jacket, Todd and I did find someone who had the Diane Linklater story, uh, was just giving away DVD copies of it that he had burned. And he did say he's trying to find Hag in a Black Leather Jacket, but he goes, That's, it's a hard, hard one to find, mainly because the stuff was made on 16 millimeter, like, or Super 8 films. And again, as we discussed in my last program, a uh, little bit on film preservation. If this film is not stored well, it's not gonna keep. Uh, Roman <laughs> Candles is the um, debut of both Divine and Mink. Eat Your Makeup uh, features Divine being just as Jackie Kennedy. Uh, Divine, I mean, Divine could, Todd, I think Divine could honestly be a program in and of itself. Cause I mean, Divine had sure the sheer cultural impact alone. I yeah, because so. she had a whole career, um, both Divine and Glenn had whole careers outside of John. Um, but Divine always really wanted to be Elizabeth Taylor. Like that was the style that just, they wanted to emulate. So whenever they got, you know, usually if you looked in John Waters movies, she would kind of have the Elizabeth, Crayler, Elizabeth Taylor on a, on some kind of a, of a narcotic, but um, this is where you get to see her as Jackie Kennedy. Um, so if you ever want to look up images of that, it's it's a sight. Uh, the first feature length film is Mondo Trasha, which we did discuss briefly last month. Um, it's really not very good. And I say this as a Waters fan, as someone who's watched it, John himself has said it would have been better as a short film. And it's likely never going to get an official release again outside of the VHS because all of the music that was used was unlicensed. And he's like, it's going to cost over a million dollars to license it. And he kind of sees it as not worth it. Um, but it is up on archive.org if you'd like to see it. And John just fully supports like, I mean, you can see it without paying for it. He doesn't, he just doesn't mind. Um, Unfinished movie, which I really wish I could have seen because I love the title of this, Dorothy the Kansas City Pothead. <laughs> there is um, on the Dreamlanders website, there's like two minutes of it. It was never, um, I think it's the only existing two minutes from it, but I just look at that and I'm like, I would love to see Pat Moran play Dorothy because uh, Pat Moran's a character. So his second feature length film definitely is more polished and structured film than Mondo Trasho is Multiple Maniacs. So this is 1970. And it wasn't seen for a long time. It didn't have the long lasting cultural impact that Pink Flamingos have had mainly because 
again, 16 millimeter print, kind of hard to preserve. It didn't have the VHS shelf life and it didn't have the infamy of pink flamingos, which we'll get to. Um, so it's about a band of traveling thieves and con artists, just typical John Waters fashion. And it's the debut of a lot of people that you will come to see in Water Staple. We have David, we have, um, we have Mary Vivian Pierce, we have Mink Stoll. I mean, uh, you also have little bits, um, parts from some other Dreamlanders. And again, a lot of people looked at this as it's kind of the test run for Pink Flamingos because there's images and scenes in here that are definitely pushing the boundaries. Most notably the scene where Divine is assaulted by a giant lobster. Yes, you're hearing this correctly. Um, it was recently released by the Criterion about five years ago. It was its first, I think, any DVD released at all for it. And uh, it's kind of come back into being a larger part of the Waters um, canon where it was kind of forgotten for a while. There were, for a long time, I actually thought that Pink Flamingos was his first movie because I'm like, oh, I'd never even heard of Multiple Maniacs. So it's taking its rightful place in his legacy. So now we get to Pink Flamingos, um, as I call it, the watershed moment of filth. And uh, my uncle, the one that um, John and I share a birthday with, he saw Pink, he told me, he goes, oh, I saw Pink Flamingos in theaters in the mid seventies. And he said, we did not know what we were getting into. We just heard you have to see this to believe it. And uh, with that alone, you can see why this became a midnight movie staple in kind of this idea of like, you have, you will not believe what the people are getting away with in this film. Um, and also, I mean, just a real true star making performance by Divine as Babs Johnson. Um, I've joked, I've joked about a couple of movies that Divine's been in. I'm like, oh, in an ideal world, she would have gotten an Oscar. But I kind of look at this and I'm like, this is, I don't think you can call it anything other than star making because this is such an iconic role. I mean, this is, there. Um, you see drag queens referencing this all the time. You see this referenced in cinema. You'll see people quoting it. You'll see the image of Divine in that red dress has become something that I absorbed via cultural osmosis before I had even seen this film. So plot of this movie, it's not really much of a plot. It's Bab Johnson um, and her son and a friend, they live in a trailer and they're battling with this couple called the Marbles for the title of filthiest person alive. And a lot of it's just kind of vignettes that kind you know, fairly tie together as a plot. Uh, we also have Edith Massey as Babs' mother who is obsessed with eggs. Uh, some behind the scenes stuff, but uh, Edith was not great at memorizing her lines. She had a lot of trouble with that. And John's like, oh, Divine would genuinely get frustrated with Edith. Because he's like, Divine took this role seriously. It's like, no, I'm a performer. Like, I came to work knowing my lines, Dagnabbit. Which I, I just, I love that as an anecdote. Because you watch this movie, you kind of think like, oh, this is just a guy and his friends screwing around, which they kind of were. But knowing that there was this level of professionalism and craft to it is a you know, it gives you a different perspective to it. One of the things that I learned at camp was when they interviewed Kathleen Turner this year, she, and, uh, she said like, oh, John really doesn't like people to improvise that much. He ha he's like, no, stick to the script that I gave you. He's a fairly meticulous director when it comes to what he's written down and what he wants. So Pink Flamingos premiered Baltimore Film Festival. And again, just it it kind of caught like wildfire because there's stuff that happens in this movie, some of which I can't really say because this is a library program. I would just say, well, there are descriptions of the movie and plot summaries that are out there if you would like to look. Um, again, this idea of, I can't believe people are getting away with this on film. And th there were, like a lot of the everyday critics were fairly scandalized by this, um, not just this, but his other films. John, um, Roger Ebert didn't really rate this movie because I don't think I can really call this a film. A film, could, I, his review is zero stars. And he's like, I can't even review this as a movie because it's not a movie. Um, the signature scene from this is probably what Pink Flamingos is most infamous for, which is divine eating dog waste. 
which no, that's not a prop, but John has said, he goes, oh yeah, we only did that once. I'm not a monster. Uh, again, it's, uh, most movies would not do that. So imagine being like 1972, 73 and hearing, oh my gosh, have you heard there's a movie where this happens? You have to admit, you might be a little curious and go, oh, you, you just can't be real. Moving on to his follow-up, Female Trouble, which didn't wasn't really well received when it came out, although it did lead to a great um, Rex Reed review where he goes like, who are these people? Where do they go when the sun, when the sun sets? Isn't there a law against this? Which I think John would and probably does take that as the ultimate compliment. Um, so as much as Pink Flamingos is, has the infamy Female Trouble, and Todd, I think you'd agree, is a much stronger and more cohesive film in terms of plot and storyline. Plot well, storyline and also just message in a way, like, I think Flamingos, there's kind of the, it's the weird mission statement of just, again, pure filth. Female Trouble, there is also the, it is part of what becomes a recurring theme in, in some of his later work, which is basically like that weird gray area between celebrity and notoriety. Yes, and this is also, I mean, you can tell with John's earlier movies, he definitely has kind of a little true crime um, fan thing going on. This kind of takes it to a darker level um, where we follow one girl who, you know, she she hates school. She wants to be a delinquent. There's a great scene where she's smoking with her friends and she goes like, I hope I get kicked out of school. And she runs away from home when she doesn't get the cha-cha heels she wants for Christmas. She meets a man who is also played by Divine, by the way. Uh, they get together, uh, you know, nine months later, Don Davenport is pregnant and she wants money. Uh, great side story about that. Apparently Divine was performing one time and a heckler told him to go, um, go screw himself. And Divine just yelled, I already did that in female trouble. <laughs> I mean, good, good, for, good for them for having a retort on hand. But you know, then she becomes a, a poor single struggling mother and eventually is recruited by this couple called the Dashers who believe that crime is beauty. And it ends fairly darkly um, where Dawn is executed for her crimes. Uh, but it's, it's a really interesting film again, cause it feels like it, predicts, it predicted this kind of weird obsession we have with celebrities and, and the you know the criminal celebrity culture where um i mean todd like was this pre or post women sending love letters to ted bundy in prison that's actually a good question let me double check on that really quick yeah so i mean this isn't too far from this woman just tr you know trying to become a celebrity via becoming a criminal and asking who wants to die for art uh i did say i'd touch on the douglas cirk reference um there is, there is a great scene where, you know, Dawn has her young daughter Taffy and she's, you know, trying to raise her and she just cuts her jump rope in half and she complains to her friends like, I've done everything a mother can do. I've locked her in a room. I've beat her with the car aerial. Nothing changes her. It's hard being a loving mother. Like just very uh, like Mildred Pierce in this, uh, this film where you also see just, uh, just some crazy things happen. So to answer your question from before, yeah, no, 1974 was actually the year Bundy started killing. So Waters kind of was ahead of the curve on this one. Yeah, this is, I, I, there is a reason that when you read the Criterion, uh, the essay that came with the Criterion edition, the person who's writing about it is like, there is an eerie prescience of this film. So if you watch this now, knowing like how much of a business true crime is, it's a really eerie film to, to, uh, to look at. So we are going to have to take a little uh, detour to Waters and Crime. Because, um, again, no secret he's a true crime fan. He's kind of fascinated by criminals. He, uh, but there are some, like, unsavory aspects to this. Um, so as I'll say, uh, I just say here, fun fact, he's a true crime fan. He's he likes he likes the trial aspect of this stuff and he was very interested with the manson family and the manson murders and this is a not so fun fact and something that he is i wouldn't say walked back i would say just apologized for owned up to this mistake 
He dedicated female trouble to Tex Watson. And if you watch the Criterion edition, that dedication is still there. It hasn't been removed. And Pink Flamingo is donated to Sadie, Katie, and Les, which are Susan Atkins, Patricia Carmwinkle, and Leslie Van Houten. Um, so in the, his book, Role Models, he does write about this and he says, quote, I'm guilty too, guilty of using the Manson murders as a jokey, smart ass way in my earlier films without the slightest feeling for the victim's families or the lives of the brainwashed Manson killer kids who are also victims in this sad and terrible case. So John, clearly, if you can look at that statement, does have some sympathy for the Manson kids in that where he feel in, in so much that he feels which I don't think there's any, you know, anyone would disagree, you know, very clearly manipulated by a terrifying uh, man in Charles Manson. Um, how much you feel they are also victims, that is your mileage may vary. Um, so he has actually become, fr the reason he is kind, he kind of has sympathy for them. And he's talked about this because he's like, you know, these were very close to who my friends were. We were parents, we were kids of suburbia. We were kind of starting to get disillusioned by, you know, the picture perfect world of post-war America, but seeing kind of all the cracks in it. And the way he put it, he's like, I, in an, in an alternate world, potentially my friends and I could have fallen victim to this kind of guy. We just decided to go make movies to shock people. So I think he feels not quite a kinship, but sort of the reason he feels sympathy is because he's like you know who knows maybe I could have been taken in by someone like that um and he's actually become friends he started writing letters to Leslie Van Houten who was um she was present for only the La Bianca murders not the Tate murders um and he has advocated for her parole his book Role Models he writes um an extensive essay about her and based on what I've read in that essay and from what I've read in sources independent of that, she at the very least does seem like someone who is extremely remorseful and has tried to, you know, be a better person and try to grow beyond that. Whether you think she deserves parole, I think, again, I don't think anyone here knows what the right answer to that is, but I actually would recommend people read that piece and read his essay on Leslie Van Houten because he, he usually he uses that as a way to go like isn't this what we want we want people to have remorse to be rehabilitated and it's a very empathetic essay for everyone involved and so the reason I recommend it I tell people if you think John Waters is just this guy who makes jokey movies like Pink Flamingos there's also a very human side to this man and He's also friends with Patty Hearst, who we'll discuss, has made cameos in a number of other his other movies. Um, but yeah, he definitely does regret some of the more uh, unsavory ways uh, he involved the Manson family in his early work. So on to Desperate Living. Um, take on a women's prison film, a take on class. Uh, this is actually not one of my favorite Waters movies. I love the way that this movie begins. It begins with Mink Stoll, um, if you can see bottom right, having a full on breakdown and it's hysterical. It's one of my favorite opening scenes to any film. Um, I actually have a t-shirt that just says, go home to your mother, doesn't she ever watch you? And actually the follow-up line to that is, this isn't some communist daycare center. <laughs> Um, but you know, after she and her wife, uh, or no, she and her maid kill her husband, they're forced to go to Mortville, which is a shanty town of criminals who are, you know, ruled over by Queen Carlotta, played by the great Edith Massey, uh, who is just kind of carried around throughout this whole film, just going like, hey, stupid, hey, ugly. I, I love Edith Massey. I think she's, she's just such a wonderful presence in these movies because you just get the sense that she was just happy to be on camera. Um, so it is also the only film of the Trask trilogy to not star Divine. Uh, Divine had a commitment to a play and, you know, Divine slash Glenn, they, um, was trying to have a career outside of John, like Glenn Milstein wanted to be an actor and he was also taking male roles towards the end of his life while also doing Divine. Um, so he's just like, Hey, I don't want to be, you know, I want to try something new. So, um, 
it's really in many cases Mink Stoll's movie. We also see Jean uh, Jean Hill. She becomes a Dreamlander. This is her debut. Um, unfortunately, David Lockery, who is previously in his other films, is not in this movie. Uh, David died. Uh, he injured himself while on PCP and died due to those injuries. So Female Troubles, unfortunately, his last film with John. Um, again, not my favorite movie, but I would recommend if you'd like, uh, go on YouTube and just search The Desperate Living Opening. Mink Stoll's breakdown is hilarious. Uh, and I mean, Todd can attest, I, I've, yell, I've, I've yelled and quoted parts of that many a time. <laughs> Surprisingly, not to the cats yet. <laughs> so we're going on to my favorite movie, which is Polyester. This is my favorite Waters film. And this is also a very good entry point for people. It is a good mix of his old 70s, like really transgressive style and a more mainstream look. But this wasn't mainstream, just him trying to sell out. I mean, he's famously said, I'd like to sell out. No one's buying what I want, what I'm selling though. Um, but he really was kind of scared of being known as just the filth guy. So, uh, there was a quote from the Criterion essay where he's like, I had done the shock value thing and it was becoming boring. I had this nightmare of myself at 80 making movie about uh, movies about people eating colostomy bags, which, ugh, what an image. So this is, um, again, John loves Douglas Sirk. This is his take on a Douglas Sirk women's picture from the 1950s, like All That Heaven Allows, Magnificent Obsession. So this is, and this is also divine at her truly, her most Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, look at that screenshot. She, she could pass for Liz. So this is uh, the trials and tribulations of Francine Fishpaw. She has a philandering husband who owns a porno theater and that brings protesters to her house. She has a rebellious daughter, a deviant son who stomps on people's feet and she has a really cruel mother. The only person who treats her with any humanity is uh, her friend Cuddles who played by the great Edith Massey. And she meets a handsome stranger played by former teen heartthrob Tab Hunter, who, by the way, was just gung-ho for this part. He, he was just saying, like, his agent was like, oh, no, you can't do a John Waters movie. And Tab Hunter was like, oh, but I want to. Um, it's a great, it's a, a great take um, on the melodramas. And Todd, uh, would you like to explain your thoughts on this movie? Because this is one of the first ones I showed you. So, actually, I'm going to be completely honest. Technically, I saw this one, I first saw this one solo because... As we've kind of discussed in previous previous presentations, there's a podcast, 80s All Over, which discusses the movies in the 1980s. When they discussed this one, they mentioned it as specifically as Waters doing a riff on Douglas Sirk, which, as somebody who had taken a genres course in college on melodrama, it was like, okay, I'm familiar with Sirk's work. I'm intrigued. And I came to the other side of it going, oh my God, I get exactly what this movie is going for, and I love it for that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really good. So if you're a fan of like the stuff that you see on TCM, this is probably a perfect entry point for Waters. And um, actually, one of the reasons it works is, as we discussed, he very clearly loves this. Like he is yeah. having fun with the jokes, but it's not like he's acting like he's above it. He's, it's, it's, a, it's a channel to make, make the jokes rather than making the jokes at its expense. Exactly. And, and again, this, this is, I, when I look at whenever John does any kind of a genre, I'm like, this is just John Waters take on a genre. This isn't John making fun of something. John genuinely loves this stuff. I mean, John's made musicals because he's like, oh, I just like musical movies. He doesn't think musicals are stupid. He's like, no, I want to make a musical. And so this polyester for him, he goes, no, I want to make a sad housewife movie. Uh, speaking of 80s all over, the way it was described by, um, I believe it was one of the hosts, Scott Weinberg, um, one of the things that they had discussed is in the late 70s, early 80s, there was this uh, trend of a lot of these movies like, oh God, the American family's changing and people are getting divorced and teens are acting out as if, you know, number one, as if it had never happened before, but uh, I believe Scott's words where he's like, it's like John Waters looked at those movies and said, no, guys, you're doing this all wrong. <laughs> and just polyester is such a treat. Uh, I will say if you are a dairy patron um, or just a G Milks patron, we do have a copy of polyester at the library and I'd wholly recommend watching it. It is my favorite Waters movie and actually just one of my favorite films. 
So on to his other film of the 80s and probably his biggest mainstream hit. And I gather the way a lot of people who are my age probably first saw John Waters' film. And it's his safest movie. And that's 1988's Hairspray. Or again, John Waters does the unthinkable and makes a PG movie, which at that point, there were people like, is he selling out? But again, as John said, he goes, no, I've always wanted to make a movie like this. And for him... This movie is a love letter to Baltimore. Um, It's not a sellout at all. He's like, this is everything I want. It's crazy outfits. It's big hair. It's big personalities. And again, Baltimore. So it's about Tracy Turnblad played by Ricky Lake. She's a plus size girl. She wants to be a dancer on the Courtney Collins show. And then she gets the dancing part, becomes a minor celebrity, but also um, decides like, oh, I'm going to advocate uh, advocate for integration and becomes an activist. It's also a great Pia Zadora cameo. It's Pia Zadora and Rick Ocasek playing beatniks. So it's something you can look up. We also have um, Debbie Harry in it, Sonny Bono in it. It's a, definitely a more loaded cast than previous Waters movies, but it's just a joyful film. And it's one that absolutely everyone can enjoy. Um, Sadly, it is Divine's final role. Divine passed away in 1988, just I think a little bit after this film's release, leaving just a, a crater in pop culture. Because I, I always think about like, man, what could have been if Divine had lived uh, longer and like, or was still here? Um, you know, it's unfortunately something we'll never know. But again, Hairspray is another one where it's like, if you just want a movie that's going to make you feel great, Hairspray is great. Um, and I, I was listening to talk, talk about this on Mark Marin, and he's just like, I think I made a movie that even people who were, who were slightly uh, racist can love because the integration subplot, he considers it pretty like covert. Um, Actually, by the way, I think it's not behind the paywall yet. If you are a fan of Mark Maron's WTF podcast, the John Waters interview is absolutely great. But yeah, it's a great movie with a great message and a lot of heart. Because again, as John said, all of my movies are made with a sense of joy. So again, a sad detour now. The 80s were really hard for John because he lost not just Divine, but two of his other friends. And he lost David Lockery in 1977. Um, so, I mean, again, David Lockery was not in Desperate Living because he was on PCP and not that John is a square about drugs. He's like, we, we all use stuff, but as he just put it, David's addiction was too much for him to deal with. And he just kind of said, that's it. You're not in the movie. Um, so he died in 1977 at 32. And unfortunately the relationship was slightly strained due to his drug use. And I think from what I've, he doesn't talk about it too much, but I think there's a lot of regret there of like what could have been done. And maybe if the relationship wasn't so strained, things could have gone a little bit differently. Again, uh, Divine, uh, Glenn Milstead died at 42 from a heart attack, March 7th, um, 1988. Great quote from John about Divine though. Cause you know, he just said, Divine didn't want to be a woman. Divine wanted to be Godzilla. Uh, I just, I love that description. Cause again, if you ever looked at Divine, you're like, yeah, that tracks. Um, Edith Massey of, um, you know, his first four big movies and just such a, a great presence. And from him, just like a love, he would just say she's a lovely woman. Um, died in 1984. Um, and Cookie Miller, who had bit parts in Female Trouble, um, Pink Flamingos, she had bit part in Polyester. Uh, she passed away from pneumonia and AIDS-related complications in 1989. So he had, he had a rough 15 years or so losing a number of friends. And, you know, these aren't just collaborators he lost. These were people who were very dear to him. Um, when t- I was at 2019, um, John gave his uh, This Filthy World performance. He talked about the end, kind of like what heaven would be like. And he said, and it's great. And then Divine is there and Cookie's there and Edith is there. And I mean, I, I don't know what his personal beliefs are. He's kind of gone on the sort of atheist route, but uh, I think he kind of thinks if there is an afterlife, I do hope I'll see these people again. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, you do look at this and you just wonder what could have been, especially in the case of Divine, in terms of cultural impact. 
Uh, you, if you'd like uh, to read any of John's books, there is a nice chapter in his book, Car Sick, where he imagines encountering Edith Massey 30 years later, turns out she had faked her death and she's just running a little secondhand store. It's a very sweet chapter. Moving on to his next film, which is Cry Baby. Um, so this is John Wood's take on a musical. And once again, this isn't John making fun of a musical. John loves musicals. He wanted to make a teen musical because for him he goes, oh, this is a take on my 50s childhood in growing up in the suburbs of Baltimore. Also starring Tracy Lords, who uh, I think this was her first legitimate film role. If you know anything about Tracy Lords. Definitely kind of a controversial casting choice. Um, this was also uh, when we first saw Patty Hearst making a little minor appearance as the as uh, Tracy Lords' character's mother. Also, probably while he wasn't a big star at the time, Johnny Depp being in this movie now is like, oh my God, Johnny Depp was in a John Waters movie, but this was 1990. This was before he really broke big. So interesting thing about Crybaby is Hairspray was such a hit. This is, people had a bidding war for this script. People wanted it. It comes out, it doesn't do well. And we were listening his uh, his uh, talk on Saturday. He goes, man, Crybaby has flopped so many times and yet it still keeps going because it flopped at the box office and then became via cable and rentals his supposedly most watched movie. So it's been, you know, redeemed by culture. Then they made a musical out of it, which flopped despite getting four Emmy nominations. And now they're trying to bring the musical back. Um, it is, again, if you like sort of the uh, 1950s teen delinquent movies, this is a love letter to these and it's a lot of fun. And so here is my other, one of my other favorite John Waters movies. If I had to save my top three, it would probably be Polyester Serial Mom and Female Trouble. Um, we had the privilege of meeting and seeing a Q&A with the great Kathleen Turner this weekend, who, by the way, is still, she just, she doesn't take any guff from anybody, and I love that. Um, she's still just a riot to listen to. She's great. I, I could listen to her being interviewed forever and she still has that great husky voice. So this is a satire on both crime, true crime and kind of the criminal celebrity culture, which he's kind of talked about this is it's sort of a sequel to Female Trouble or the successor to Female Trouble. So Kathleen Turner stars as a housewife who turns out kills people for the pettiest of reasons, like not recycling or uh, you, you know, might be a principal who thinks that her son is just bad at math and stupid, or you're the boy who cheated on her teenage daughter, um, or you are a juror who wore white shoes after Labor Day. And no, fashion has not changed. And yet yeah, lower, lower right-hand side, that is Patty Hearst's juror number eight. That is another, I can't put the clip up here. We don't wanna be flagged for copyright, but uh. The great white after, just search on YouTube, Serial Mom White After Labor Day, and just be prepared to laugh. Some great, a great delivery from Kathleen Turner as well. Um, and again, probably one of the more loaded casts, because you have Kathleen Turner, you have Sam Waterston, uh, cameos by Patty Hearst, you also have Susan Summers making a cameo. Uh, there's also Mink Stoll is in this, is a great uh, side role as the poor woman that, Kathleen Turner keeps crank calling. And if you're a punk fan, uh, L7 has cameo in here as well. Uh, I think, again, it's like Female Trouble. It's one of his more, uh, the movies that go a little bit deeper in terms of really looking at society. This is why I wish John could make more movies. I'd love to see him make a movie about true crime culture now, because it's just evolved. The way it's evolved, both from Female Trouble and from Serial Mom is rife with material. So on to Pecker, or as John calls it, my nice movie, which it is. Pecker was actually, I am pretty sure, the first John Waters movie I saw. It was in heavy rotation on Comedy Central in the early aughts. And uh, me being a weirdo who didn't have a lot of friends and liked comedy, I'm like, oh, I'll watch this movie. I've heard of John Waters. This is my, this is my only exposure. My parents certainly won't let me rent anything from the video store by him. 
Um, so it stars Edward Furlong um, and Christina Ricci. And it's about a little amateur photographer from Baltimore who unexpectedly finds fame when he takes a, um, I can't say what the photograph is of, but it's a photograph at a go-go bar that his sister works at and it becomes big with the hoity-toity art community. And it definitely looks at kind of the darker side of fame and what happens when you have a magnifying glass turned on you and your family. And ultimately, Pecker is kind of, um, Edward, the character, Edward Furlong, he kind of goes like, I don't want the hoity-toity artwork. I want my weird little family and my weird little community. And this can really, as Roger Ebert pointed out, a little bit about Waters probably his own tension with his roots and the more mainstream success he was finding and you know not wanting to be constrained by rules or turn into someone that he wasn't uh there is a fun story about this title um waters has talked about how the mpa originally didn't want him to use that title because it's it's slang for something but as he brought up he goes like uh there's stuff like free willy being made you you allow that <laughs> So eventually they said, fine, it's okay, especially since it's the character's last name. Um, but yeah, Pecker, it doesn't get the attention of his other movies. It's not, it's more vulgar than something like Hairspray or Crybaby. Um, it, it's, it, but it's sweet. And again, I, I think I'd agree with John that it might be his nicest movie because the core message is about like doing what you love rather than just doing something for fame. And if you look at John's career, that's his entire career is he wants to make the stuff he wants to make. Cecil B. Demented. Uh, this is a fun one. So this is stars Melanie Griffith as a uh, Hollywood actress who's kidnapped by a gorilla uh, filmmakers who are called the Sprocket Holes. Fun fact, at Camp John Waters, there is a film festival and they call it the Sprocket Holes Film Festival. Uh, this is a take on the Patty Hearst kidnapping. <laughs> Patty Hearst does have cameo in this. Uh, she was asked about this one because she was also had a Q&A this year. And she just seemed a little like, I really didn't think about it. I was just making a movie. Uh, the one thing I've learned is Patty does not like to talk about that stuff. Um, but it's uh, so Melanie Griffith is an actress. She's kidnapped by a guerrilla filmmaking crew. They want to make like, the ultimate independent movie like Dogma 95 on steroids uh, and they really hate mainstream culture. Um, there is a joke in here where they crash the set of Forrest Gump 2. And I do wanna let people know that while there is never a Forrest Gump 2 film, there was a sequel to the book that inspired Forrest Gump. So it's not that far off that it could happen. Um, it's again, this, this one might be not as accessible to everybody. Um, and again, you, it's one of John's favorite movies. He really speaks highly of it. I think it is especially like what he's dealt with, with the Hollywood system at this point is kind of the, this really seems to be him kind of digging into, I know, I kind of want to, I want to go back to my roots a little bit. And so Dirty Shame is his final movie, 2004. Um, Tracy Ullman uh, plays a very repressed woman who gets a concussion and becomes a sex maniac. It also starts Johnny Knoxville kind of at the height of the jackass fame as well. Um, it's, it's, I think this movie's very funny and thankfully got an NC-17. I mean, I, if this is John Waters' final film, it's got to be NC-17, but by the time 2004 rolls around, the culture had changed so much uh, in terms of what's acceptable and what's shocking. Again, Jackass was on the air and what in a huge hit for a cable television show. So there really is kind of a sense of like, what's like, how can you even shock someone now? <laughs> Um, it's still a lot of fun. Actually, I think the best performer in this movie is Selma Blair. She plays Tracy Ullman's daughter with those, um, again, the cartoonishly big chest. And that's something that's very John Waters where it's, it's to the point of it being, um, comedic rather, um, rather than I would just say straight up obscene. Uh, again, I, I would, it's not for everybody, kind of like Female Trouble, kind of like Pink Flamingos. This is not a film I would just recommend to everyone, but I would say if you're a fan, it's worth seeing. There are some good performances in it. Um, 
the one downside of this is since the film didn't perform poorly, John had an idea for another film called Fruitcake. And between this film not doing well and then the recession hitting a few years later, really kind of put Fruitcake in the ground. And as of right now, I mean, he still wants to make it, but as of right now, this is his final movie. But John has found ways to evolve past his film career. So John is also an actor. He's actually been performing since the 1980s. He was in Jonathan Demme's Something Wild. Um, he's been in horror movies like the Chucky series and he has been in, in Alvin and the Chipmunks movie. He actually had a great anecdote about that um, this weekend where he goes like, he said, he goes, I want to do movies that nobody would expect me to do. That's why he did an Alvin and the Chipmunks movie. He goes, which is weird because now I'm in the airport and kids recognize me and they're like, oh my God, you're from Alvin and the Chipmunks, pick me up. And he just said, are you bleeping kidding me? I can't do that, I'll be arrested. He just goes, look at me, I can't do this. <laughs> but um, he's, he, again, he's trying to always do something that people wouldn't expect him to do. Um, Cause I think if people go like, oh, what would John Waters star in? They're like, oh, John Waters would probably maybe do an episode of Jackass or It's Always Sunny, which, ooh, I'd love to see him on It's Always Sunny. But the fact that he always likes to defy expectations and kind of go where you don't expect him to go is what makes him so much fun. Um, he's also been on Law and, Ver Law and Order SVU very recently. He's just a fan of that show and he plays a, um, a, a pornography hustler. <laughs> You know, as as one, that's actually something you would expect. And as I mentioned before, he was on The Simpsons. Uh, apparently, he just felt like, well, if it's good enough for Elizabeth Taylor, it's good enough for me. And uh, his episode of The Simpsons, as I've said before, is really good and holds up really well. He also was on Feud, uh, which was the FX series about the feud between uh, Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. And he played one of his heroes, William Castle. I would say the role he was born to play. He did also get to star in uh, Blood Feast 2, which was directed by Herschel Gordon Lewis. So he's kind of used his post-directing career to sort of live out some of his dreams. And what is his dream role? Um, I found an interview where he just said, oh, a Final Destination movie, mainly because he likes the franchise and he just wants a really creative death which can't blame him for that. <laughs> and the, um, he's also transitioned into being an author, although similar with acting, he's been doing this since the 1980s. His first book was Shock Value, 1981, followed it up with a Crackpot, The Obsessions of John Waters. Um, he's done stuff like uh, Director's Cut. He's also, he is, has kind of an art career. He is a bit of an art collector. He's done um, art exhibit so he's done books about that um, but again after uh, a dirty shame comes out you start to see a real uptick in what he's writing and a lot of books coming out so 2010 we see role models 2014 we see Carsick 2017 make trouble and 2019 is his latest book um, Mr. Know-it-all uh, I am pleased to announce that next year in May of 2022 his first book, fiction book, is coming out. And I am blanking on the name. <laughs> Todd, do oh, you remember the name of that book? Not off the top of my head. This is driving me nuts because oh, it's going to hit me later. It, it's, it, we're going, it's, um, well, I, you can look that up and I can talk about his other books. So Role Models was where he had, he talks about a number of people that have inspired him. Um, this is where we see the chapter on Leslie Van Houten, um Karsik, so this is something that he actually did he did hitchhike across the united states and wrote about it but what makes Karsik interesting is it's actually three little books in one the first is what would the best case scenario be the second is the worst case scenario which th that is actually one that ends in his death in a humorous john waters way because when you think about john waters as a gay man hitchhiking and ending in death you're like no that's a real thing that happened how can you make it funny well let, let me just assist john found a way to make it funny and then the third is what really happened and he ends that book by saying that this really kind of re reinforced his belief in the decency in everyday people and uh okay, I found it. what 
His upcoming book slated for 2022, Liar Mouth. A Liar Mouth, that was it. So yes, Liar Mouth is going to be his first fiction book in 2022. And uh, Mr. Noah's All, The Tarnished Wisdom of Phil Felder, a lot of fun to read. Um, he is a great, like, he is a really good author. And he's really a smart, well-read man. He has, I think, over 8,000 books in his house. Uh, again, I think if you only know him from something like Pink Flamingos, you might not assume that he is a very well-read, very intelligent person. But I think just the career of John and John himself can prove, you know, looks can be deceiving. Your first impressions can sometimes not be correct. And just John is a public figure. So uh, this filthy world, it originally started as a documentary and it's become a one man show. Uh, each year at camp, he performs it to us. Each year, it's a little bit different. Um, this year, it was kind of about sort of culture and sort of the idea of like, political correctness what can and can't you say but he turned it around to like oh no we need to start freaking out people more <laughs> um and uh also well we can't really say what he told us because he gave us some news but um we got some great news about some upcoming projects of his so very sad i can't say but that was another upside of this filthy world um but one of the great little hallmark uh, little bits from it that I just really laughed at where he's like, do you think Greta Thunberg was jealous of Amanda Gorman being on the cover of Vogue or something? And again, it's something where it was so not outlandish, but the, the thought of it was extremely funny. And that's why I like John, where he can kind of find these little areas to pick and paint a picture and just give you something very funny to think about. He also does a show, which I have seen, A John Waters Christmas, which is sort of a festive spin on his filthy world. Um, he loves Christmas, actually. He's like, it's a very campy holiday, and him being like Camp King, it's a no-brainer. Um, that's a lot of fun. Apparently, he might be doing it this year. Uh, so if you feel comfortable going and you're interested, keep an eye out. He usually comes to Boston. He is an artist, he does a lot of photography, um, but he's also a collector and he has recently, um, this is another thing we heard in this filthy world, which we could talk about because it's been publicized. Um, he has donated over 300 works from his personal collection to the Baltimore Museum of Art. And he said on the condition, they're like, oh, can we name the rotunda after you? And he goes, no, the bathrooms. I want the bathrooms named after me. Again, in true John fashion. Highbrow, he's an art collector. Lowbrow, I want the toilets named after me. And he recently released the Parada Pasolini, which is um, a tribute to Italian director Pierre Paolo Pasolini, director Salo, Gospel St. Matthew, a very transgressive filmmaker in his own right. So it's really sort of an ode to pushing the boundaries, which is something he likes to do. Um, and I think this is a great way to close the program. Um, He's now a beloved icon. I think to some people, like he's been on a number of shows. He's almost America's quirky, filthy uncle now. And as he wrote about it in Mr. Know-It-All, he said, suddenly the worst thing that could happen to a creative person has happened to me. I'm accepted. But I mean, he's a Funko Pop figure now. I think that's, all, that's the ultimate in being mainstream. But there's also... I think there's the reason he loves doing Camp John Waters because he's like, there is a difference between just the regular everyday acceptance and the people who truly know you and love you for your art. Um, but I also think the fact that he's accepted kind of speaks a lot to society growing a bit and being more accepting. And I think in some ways, John's work had a hand in that. Um, John's work was always, again, it was never mean. And it was always just like, hey, here are people that look different. Here are people that are different. And they're just characters. You know, they're not, they're not freaks and weirdos. They're people that I love. And there are a lot of campers that I met who were like, oh yeah, the, this definitely, I think, made me a more accepting person because I saw it, um, you know, at a fairly, um, you know, at the right age. Um, so again, from someone who is an outsider and considered to be like one of the filthiest men in cinema, someone who creates something of no value to, again, America's quirky uncle. That is the path of John. And so just a quick, where are they now? We know where John is now, but um, 
some of the other Dreamlanders. Uh, Mink Stoll, she still acts, she still sings. She's a camp counselor at Camp John Waters. We did get to meet her Friday night. Um, I to I did tell her, I'm like, your your beginning scene in Desperate Living is one of the greatest scenes ever put to film. Um, uh, Mary Vivian Pierce, she has had health issues. She had both a stroke and had to have brain surgery. So she's not really in front of the camera much anymore. Um, she did write an essay back in 2000 about, um, she did nude modeling and just, you know, kind of doing that after having surgery. So she's still kind of, you know, in Baltimore around. Uh, Pat Moran is an Emmy winning casting director. Elizabeth Coffey, uh, she got married after pink, uh, after female trouble. She got her, she finished up getting her surgery and she moved to Illinois with her husband. And she still, um, she's still an activist and she runs a support group for older trans and gender non-conforming individuals. I'd actually love to see her um, or have her as a camp counselor one year because I think her story is uh, really cool and just someone who was that you know who's been an activist for that long would be inspiring to hear uh channing wilroy um he was in pink flamingos he lives in provincetown he owned a restaurant for a bit susan lowe who is in a number of his early films she's a professor in baltimore uh ricky lake obviously she's still performing um we lost a few dreamlanders unfortunately as well jean hill from desperate living and polyester um, she was a huge advocate for gay rights um, and had an extensive comedy career before dying in 2013. Susan Walsh passed away in 2019. Van Smith uh, had a heart attack in 2016. Paul Swift, the Eggman from Pink Flamingos, passed away in 1994. Um, but a lot of the Dreamlanders, like John, are still kicking. Um, and the fans that they have gathered along the decades are going to keep their memories alive for much longer. <laughs> one of my favorite exchanges, does anyone have any questions? I had to end with one of my favorite exchanges from Pink Flamingos. <laughs> All righty. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> You can either put them in the chat or ask them. Um, if not, I would like to thank everyone for coming. Or Todd, I would say, especially as a, a first year John Waters attendee, um, what are your thoughts on, because you're kind of getting into his films now, what are your thoughts on what you've seen so far? Well, again, as, as, of, as, as of, of what I've seen, which granted, I'm still missing the middle gap of things like Crybaby, Hairspray, and I, what I've seen, I think so far, yeah, I think right now uh, my my trifecta favorites, Female Trouble, Paul Holyester, and Serial Mama, I think our orders are a bit different. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I gotta get the top spot to Female Trouble. That is just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would ultimately say, you know, not all of John's work is for everybody. A lot of his earlier stuff is a lot more niche. And I, I've told a lot of people who are interested in his work, I'm like, maybe read the Wikipedia summaries for some of his earlier films and see if it's something you want to watch or watch Polyester and kind of go, okay, maybe I feel ready to watch Pink Flamingos. I don't think it's right to just foist Pink Flamingos on a person. <laughs> I think you gotta, war you gotta warn them about that. Oh, Elise said, I watched Serial Mom as a kid and had nightmares. Oh no, but upon watching it as an adult, it's so good. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you, um, you've come, that, I'm sorry that gave you nightmares, but I do, um, I love that you love it now. And uh, I, I just love that final scene. Just, oh no, please, fashion has changed. No, it hasn't. Just that I mean, final card as well. The final title card is great. Um, it just, uh, Kathleen Turner was such a great interviewee for that. Um, and, uh, I think she, she said, she cut, she said like, well, John did say that, uh, the juror number eight was the only one that, that Betty, that, um, my character absolutely should have killed. Cause John is very, very strict about the no white shoes after Labor Day. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, and this will be on the Dairy Public Library's YouTube channel. Um, about to say thank you for bearing with us we did just return from camp today i i joked earlier that i was thinking of like wearing an askew wig and having like smeared eyeliner and pure john waters fashion but i'm like oh no it's too much work <laughs> but uh 
Thank you everyone for coming and have a wonderful night.